Hi. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, yeah, so this talk is going to be about how to estimate stock price correlations using Wikipedia. Um, let me start by telling you a little bit about myself. So um, I work for a startup in London. Uh, it's called Gnosis. Uh, I'm the chief data scientist there, and we are basically analyzing Twitter data and uh, helping finance professionals get an understanding of um, possible um, anomalies or events or other kinds of interesting information in Twitter. Before that, I obtained my PhD, a um, mixture of machine learning and natural language processing. And um, now, I want, in this talk and hopefully future talks, uh, find the middle ground between um, finance and uh, my previous um, life, let's say, which was uh, natural language processing. So this talk is going to be about um, the combination of unstructured data and finance. Um, and I've also added a link to my website if you need to know more or see more from my previous life. Um, OK, so as I said, this talk is going to be about um, Wikipedia data and how we can use Wikipedia data in order to um, find, in this case, we're not going to make predictions, but we are going to look at correlations between uh, data in Wikipedia and, um, I guess you guess, what? Stock prices. OK, so um, usually financial data, um, when we talk about financial data, we talk about pricing data. This is um, this kind of time series data is what finance professionals are used to, and they are optimizing their algorithms for processing this particular time series. However, there's also quite a lot of sources of unstructured data out there. So. Um, People are looking at things like annual reports, which contain hints on how the company was performing, what kind of future avenues they are looking at. Then there are also quite a lot of broker research. There's also conference call transcripts, um, investor relation presentations, third-party research, news and press releases. And for bigger companies, bigger banks, they also have their own researchers uh, that come up with uh, in-house content. So quite a lot of unstructured data out there. Um, however, let's try something really crazy. Let's try to see if there's any kind of signal coming from unconventional data. So when I talk about unconventional data, I'm thinking about um, data sets that have been uh, created without having any financial applications in mind. So this can be Wikipedia and its um, related projects. So DBpedia is a structured version of Wikipedia. Um, the same uh, is valid for Wikidata, uh, also obtained via um, people's collaboration. Um, then we can also look at Twitter. It turns out that Twitter is a very interesting uh, data source if we are interested in, um, for example, what various uh, people, um, what are the various people's opinion regarding certain, certain stock or what kind of events are happening out there in terms of mergers act and uh, acquisitions and so on. You can also look at Crunchbase. Crunchbase is um, a small knowledge base that's very tailored towards um, tech the technical uh, domain, specifically smaller companies, startups. Good. So um, if you talk about Wikipedia, it's, um, it's a large project. There's 10 edits per second. The English Wikipedia currently has over 5 million articles. So that's an average of 800 new articles per day. So that's 
a lot of data to, to crunch. Um, the German Wikipedia is the fourth largest with over uh, almost two million articles. Um, right, so the thing is, what can we extract from Wikipedia that is going to be similar to the type of time series that we have from pricing data and how can we relate the two? So the first thing that we can think of is, okay, I have an article in Wikipedia. Now from this article I can obtain a vector representation and ideally I want for each of my, um, let's call them um, concepts or topics, for example in this case um, DAX or German or stock market index. So for each relevant concept in Wikipedia, I want to come up with a vectorized representation. And this is going to allow me to compare different concepts between each other. And then on one hand, I will have my, my concepts that I compare and we'll see in a minute how we are going to compare them. And on the other hand, I have the pricing data. So, first thing to keep in mind, a vectorized representation out of the Wikipedia article. Um, how do we obtain that? Well, um, I think this, there's been a lot of talks around the, the word to vec model, so I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna tell you a lot about it. Just for those who haven't heard about it before, it's um, a model that uh, was, um, not necessarily developed by Mikolov, but he um, enabled it to scale, to be able to process data sets the size of Wikipedia. Um, it, um, everything starts in NLP, and in this case the same, with the distributional hypothesis that the context of the words is very, very important in order to determine meaning. Um, this model is um, is a very uh, shallow neural network, two-layer neural network. And um, the idea is that you want to learn this vector representation in order to predict the context, in order to predict nearby words. Um, okay, there's two, two flavors of this model. So you have the skipgram model and the SIBO model, continuous bag of words and the skipgram. Um, and they are basically mirrored. So in one case, you start in the input layer with your current word, and your output is going to be the context. So this is word at position um, t minus 2, word at position t minus 1, and then the two words after my current word, wt. Whereas in the continuous bag of words model, we aim for the opposite. The input is our context, and the output is our, is our word. OK, now the word to vec model um, is going to give us representations for the words in Wikipedia. However, we don't need representations for the words. We need representations for the topics of, let's say, stock market index. That's a, a three-word concept. So how we are going to be able to obtain that? Well, um, the trick is to assign the, an ID. In this case, we are going to assign an ID obtained from the DBpedia knowledge base. And we are going to replace each concept. So for example, the DAX, the blue chip, and the stock market index. We are going to replace them in text by their IDs. And by this, we are going to be able to obtain a vectorized representation using, using Word2Vec of the words, but also of these concepts that contain multiple words. Um, if you want to know more about this technique, it's called Wiki2Vec. And um, here is the repository, which contains the code. Um, and then in order to obtain our similarity, what we are going to do is we are going to apply uh, cosine similarity. So we have our concept here 
let's say Deutsche Bank and BMW, and we're gonna compute um, the cosine similarity between these two concepts now that we have the vectorized representation. So everything's straightforward so far. The other way of looking at Wikipedia is um, let's, let's assume that Wikipedia, from Wikipedia we can construct a big graph. Um, now we are going to have our concepts as nodes. Oops. There we go. We're going to have our concepts as nodes. And these nodes are going to be interlinked. So what kind of nodes can we have? Well, we can have the articles and we can also have the categories. And then for the links, there's quite a variety that we can choose from. So we can have um, hyperlinks from article to article. Then we can have also links from um, between articles based on information in the info box. We can also have links between articles and categories. And we can also have links between categories. So let me just show you what I mean by this. So in the Wikipedia article, we have all our links that point from the concept docs to quite a lot of other, other concepts. Then we also have the, the category list. So this tells us, OK, docs, companies related to docs are Adidas, Allianz, BASF, and so on. And we also have the infobox information. So again, we get information, um, sometimes uh, duplicate information that we would have also found in the article about relations between docs and other example, operator exchange, and so on. Good. Um, OK, so now that we have our graph representation, we know which are the nodes, which are the edges. Um, in order to get the similarity between two concepts, what we can do is um, two things. For example, there can be other approaches as well. Um, one simple way of looking at this is to use the distance between the, the nodes and then um, to say, OK, I can get a similarity between my two nodes, V1 and V2, based on the distance. So I just say the similarity is 1 minus the distance. And the distance, I can apply any, let's say, uh, for example, super simple shortest path uh, in the graph. Um, another way of looking at this is to use random walks in the graph. Um, you can use vanilla page rank for that, or if you want something um, that's a bit more uh, Taylor, because you know that some nodes are more important as opposed to others, you can also use a personalized page rank and tweak the weights of the nodes. Good. So um, now coming to our, our analysis, what we did is we took the 30 companies part of the DAX index, and for each company, we had information like its sector, ticker symbol, index weighing and number of employees. Um, and we used GenSim in order to construct our word to vec model. And we also used it in order to compute the similarity between the companies. So for each company pair, we obtain our word to vec similarity. OK. Next comes the pricing data. Um, so let me just ask how many of you are familiar with uh, analysis of financial data? A few of you? OK. For the rest, um, I'll go a bit more in detail. So um, OK, for a company, we get various pieces of information. So. Open means the open price, the high, low price, close price, volume, and an adjusted close. This adjusted close, is, so close is when the stock market closes, that's the, the final price for the day. And these are daily prices, so end of day prices. And um, the adjusted close is, um, let's say that the company, um, Let's say that the shares um, split. There's some restructuring within the company. Then the adjusted close price is going to reflect this kind of, of changes within the company. 
because otherwise, if, you, if we would take the close price only, then uh, we are going to see some big jumps from high values to lower values or vice versa, depending on what happens with the company and how the price is going to reflect these changes. Good. So this is our pricing data, and then we can use Panda's data reader in order to get the pricing data for each of our companies, and we can also tell it when, how, how, how far back in time we want to get this data from. Okay, next we need to obtain daily returns for each of the DAX company. Um, now, why do we need daily returns? Because if we would take the, the pricing data as such, this pricing data, you see that it has, it has a trend. It's not a stationary process. It's, the, it's mean and variance. It, it uh, changes over time. It, it, say it increases over time, as we've seen in the, in the first, uh, first slides. So what we need to do is we need to compute these daily returns, means that we are going to take the close price of today, and we are going, going to take the close price of yesterday and compute the difference. And we can do it uh, in a simple way, like here, or um, take log difference. Depends on the analysis that we want to perform. Good. Now, um, once we have all this information, we can compute the correlation for each of our possible pairs. So we have companies, the, both companies, we have our similarity, and we also have our correlation. Great. So, the million dollar question. Does Wikipedia similarity explain the correlation of returns? Any clues? No clues whatsoever. No, it doesn't. Okay. Okay, let's let's do this. How many of you say yes and how many say no? Yes. One, one doesn't count because <laughs> because he knows why. So we have we have two yes. <laughs> because he saw the talk before. But however this is this is uh this is uh DAX is not the FTSE index. Okay. So so we have two people saying yes, and the rest say no. <laughs> OK. Good. So the no win so far. So eh, what happened is that um, based on this scatter plot and based on our R square, we get some really nasty results. Any idea why this happened? So what's, what's the problem here? Mm. But there's something, there's something in particular about this scatter plot that is, that should give us. We should not be satisfied with this scatter plot. Let's say it like that. Mm, exactly. So there, there, there's this, there are these data points that don't really make sense. So, any idea what what might be the cause of such such behavior? Hmm? Competitors. Competitors, countries. It's a. It's a. Uh, it's not really that. It's a. It's one problem, which is called Commerzbank. <laughs> <laughs> so, it turns out that Commerzbank did something very nasty in 2013. Um, so what it did is it did a reverse stock split. That means that the price, um, the, the price changed a lot. And um, this changing price, because we were not, we were taking the, the close prices, this change in price um, affected our, our analysis. So you see that, if you read here, as a result the outstanding shares were reduced to around this amount, 500 million shares, from 5.8 billion, no? With the price multiplied by 10. So this greatly affected, greatly affected the pricing data. And um, just for us to, to double check, 
no, if we remove this uh, this uh, commerce bank outlier, we do get an R2 of 0 0.2, which is something that we want to get. Okay, so still, no, we cannot remove outliers just like that. Um, what would we do about it? So is it possible to, to uh, nevertheless be able to, um, to um, get meaningful results based on this data? Remember that at the beginning I was telling you about this adjusted clause that takes into account this kind of changes in price. So if you look at the adjusted clause and use adjusted clause returns, your R2 is going to make sense in this case because it incorporates, it incorporates these changes in data. And yeah, so um, what this talk and also um, previous analysis on the FTSE data set show is that um, you can use Wikipedia or probably even other unconventional data sets in order to um, see if um, unstructured data is of any help for, for determining correlations or even for making predictions. Um, there's I was showing you only what was working and what op where I did obtain results. I was not telling you where I didn't obtain results. So it turned out that um, I was also trying with the graph-based approach that I, was, uh, that I was explaining to you. And the thing there is that uh, graph-based similarity does not capture very well uh, the similarity within a specific domain. So you are looking at companies that are all within, that are all in the, this DAX index. So by default, they are very related because all of them are part of the index. Lots of them are traded on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange. And this kind of information made it that these companies were all very similar with each other, and therefore there was no correlation. Um, so I noted here, categories are too broad. No, so if, if this category information is too broad, there's very little that we can, we can, um, um, very little information that we can pull out. Um, however, the context-based uh, similarity using word to vec proved to be a powerful and robust measure, and we could we could actually capture similarity using this this method. Um, however, this is this is a toy example. So, of course, if you are going to use um, data sets that are particularly tailored for finance, uh, let's say specific reports or much better quality data, then we expect to get much better results. Um, okay, so just a few applications. So um, one thing would be, well, the obvious application is to make predictions and uh, uh, another thing is not only to use unstructured data, but also to use a combination of unstructured data and pricing data or other kinds of quantitative data, other kinds of time series data, and see where one can, can help the other. Um, you can also use it for estimating other financial figures, ratios, other statistical moments. Um, Particularly for this case, we were interested in the time preceding an IPO because then we have very little information, or maybe not at all, about what price is a certain company going to be listed at. So this turns out to be very useful. Uh, here are the resources that I've used. Uh, there's a notebook that's uh, accompanying this presentation. Uh, you're, you're also going to find there um, similar analysis that I've done on uh, on the FTSE data set and the presentation that I did in London at PyData. Um, then there's all the word 2 vec and wiki 2 vec uh, resources that I've used and um, uh, related papers on, on graph-based similarity. Good, so thank you. And if you have any questions.
Mm -hmm. It's even big. Mm -hmm. But I, I expect that even if companies are doing the same thing, also the correlation is not perfect. Right? So what's the baseline? Is it like 0.4? I have no idea. OK. OK, so the question is, um, how can we evaluate this? What does this R2 of uh, 0.2 tell us? Is this a big number? Is it a small number? What are we going to expect? So the thing is that um, we are going to we First of all, we, we don't expect that these are highly correlated. There's so much information that Wikipedia that, uh, that is encoded in Wikipedia that can explain the stock price. And this is, this R2 shows us that there is definitely signal, because if there would be zero signal, the R2 would be zero. Okay? Uh, and it's more quantifying how much signal can I pull out of Wikipedia? How much correlation can I explain only looking at Wikipedia data? And this is this fraction. Um, I would say a reasonable amount, a reasonable number is 0 0.2, 0 0.3. I don't expect to see numbers like one. No, I don't expect to see perfect correlation. Also because this is not a data set that was built uh, having in mind that you are going to be able to neither predict anything. There's, there's no, or there's very little predicting power, or there's very little, uh, no, the, the um, the reason why Wikipedia was created was not to analyze financial data. The point that I want to make is that even if you look at data sets that are completely, uh, that are created with completely different purposes in mind, still this should not be disregarded. Unstructured data should not be disregarded because there is signal in unstructured data. And the signal should not only come from pricing data, for quantitative data. This is the point. Uh, I have a question. Um, and, and this, is, this is a question for NLP uh, purposes, so the NLP community, but to you uh, especially. Uh, what do VEX, what, uh, from what I know, according to my knowledge, there is a passive one, which is a little more passive one. That's probably the best. It's, it's crazy for me, but uh, oh well, we have it. Mm -hmm. uh, so my question would be you know, let's say you, you subtract from one like that, and in a few years, you know, you, you compare the results. Okay, so the question was, um, Google, th this is Google, word of is Google's proprietary algorithm, let's say. Um, am I not afraid that if I do analysis and I use Google's proprietary algorithms, um, at some point Google are going to come knocking at my door and say, hey, wait a second. Um, so this is a toy example, and this is a demonstration for people for making people aware that there's more there's more information out there and oops sorry <laughs> there's more information out there and there's more interesting things that we should we should pay attention to if i would want to um, come up with uh, an algorithm and i would want to start trading um, then no you're right i wouldn't use um, proprietary algorithms. What I would do is most likely I will anyways need to come up with a specifically tailored algorithm to my problem. And it's not going to be a vanilla word to vec. Uh, already the process that I will uh, go when extracting the data from, let's say, if I take Wikipedia, um, it's not going to be taking something already existing out there, a pre-trained model, and then compute similarities, and uh, there you go, I get, I get my correlations, and from there I can come up with a predictive model. There, there is no free lunch. So there is not gonna, uh, no, taking the code from this presentation and running it on um, models that uh, Google pre-trained or you know, somebody else pre-trained is not gonna, <coughs> be the holy grail of yeah, 
Yeah, so the model is is a very simple model. There's, I would say that if if at all you would use it as a baseline, you would say, okay, using this kind of model, this is these are the results that I can come up with, and then you can build on top of that, and your extensions and your algorithm that is going to be specifically tailored to your problem is going to be quite quite different from from where to vec. Yeah. Don't know if that answers your question. No question? Um, I'm not sure, but I feel like if you do it like this, you have uh, a look ahead bias in your, in your prediction. Because if you would do it properly, you work to vec first presentation for a point in time before the time period that you are Otherwise, it would be possible that information from both time periods is added into Wikipedia, and leading to a higher correlation than you, than you would get. Mm. Okay, let me see how to summarize your question. So, you are saying that um, the the way that I'm doing my analysis is not necessarily appropriate because information that is in the stock pr in the price is also reflected in wikipedia articles at after a certain point in time no that is the question so how to how to take that into account um, well first of all it's not really the case that information in wikipedia the information in wikipedia information that you have in the stock price is really um, is there is really a one to one relationship because as I said, Wikipedia, you have completely different, it's, it's built for completely different purposes. So you will have in there lots of things around, um, I don't know, conflicts. If you take, for example, the Volkswagen article about all the scandal that they are having with emissions and you're going to have a lot of, but it's going to be, um, it's going to be very descriptive. It's going to be a lot of, of um, I don't know, conflicting information and that, from that to be able to derive something that uh, is uh, meaningful in terms of the price is already pretty hard. So if I take, you know, if I take a word to vec model, this model is going to show me a very shallow kind of similarity. And mainly it's going to show me that these two companies share the same uh, sector, they have uh, similar products and so on. And that's some generic information. There's generic information that's available out there. Um, and moreover, this is intended that if you don't have any information about a particular company, only text information, you don't have any price information, are you able to use this text information or you sh should you just discard it? Yeah, but I mean, using text information, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you want to predict the, the, the correlation for next year, you should use the word to back of the presentation of the day and not of the end of next year. Again, I am not making any prediction here. This is not a predictive model. This, the, the goal of this talk is not to show that there is predictive power. The goal of this talk is to show that there is correlation between Wikipedia and pricing data. It's not a predictive I'm not building a predictive model. <laughs> because, um, first of all, because of his point. No, because if you, you want to build a predictive model, then the setup has to be completely different. Um, second of all, because this predictive model will be pretty poor, because there is very little information. So there is not that there's no information, but still 
there's little information that you can extract from Wikipedia. So you have to combine it with something else. You need to, you will still need some, some different source that is, that's gonna give you that extra piece of information. Otherwise, you're not gonna perform really well. No? So, yeah. Hmm? Were all the companies in the same industry? No. They were in different industries? Have you yeah. considered like, SIC code as an alternative me measure of similarity that could just give you another benchmark to compare the point to versus, you know, just industry? No, but I would be happy to talk about this. Um, okay, so the question was uh, if I was considering any other kind of similarity um, or if I was looking at particular within sector similarity, things like that. Thank you.